Hello. In this video, we are going to discuss the hydrolysis of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, from the point of view of thermodynamics. The student might recall that ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is an important biochemical molecule that's involved in the storage and transfer of energy within a living thing. Two of the important sources of ATP are, first, glycolysis, the breakdown of sugars, particularly glucose, and the second, in forms even more in the citric acid cycle. which is often known as the Krebs cycle. The energy stored in ATP can be released by hydrolysis of ATP. So this is the reaction of ATP with water, giving ADP, which is the adenosine diphosphate, so it only has two phosphate groups, plus one unit of inorganic phosphate. And the standard Gibbs free energy for this reaction has been determined to be minus 31 kilojoules per mole. Recall that the standard Gibbs free energy, so that's the G with the superscript of zero. Sometimes we call this delta G naught. Naught is just another word for zero. Takes place under so-called standard conditions. In the standard conditions, the concentration of each of the reactants is one molar, and the concentration of any gases involved is one atmosphere. And we notice that since the standard Gibbs free energy is a negative quantity, under standard conditions, this reaction is going to be spontaneous. Another incredibly important relationship to recall from thermodynamics is that the equilibrium constant for a reaction is related to the standard Gibbs free energy. K, the equilibrium constant, is equal to E to the minus delta G naught divided by RT, where R is the gas constant and T is the thermodynamic temperature, which means the temperature expressed in kelvins. So this important relationship links the standard Gibbs free energy and the equilibrium constant for the reaction. So in the next step, what we're going to do is calculate the equilibrium constant of this reaction as written using the fact that we have the experimental uh, data that the standard gives free energy is equal to minus 31 kilojoules per mole. We can simplify this expression by taking the natural logarithm of each side. So that gives us that the natural log of K, the equilibrium constant, is equal to minus delta G naught the standard Gibbs free energy, divided by R times T. We know that the standard Gibbs energy is minus 31 kilojoules per mole, so we have another minus sign here. So we get a numerator that is equal to a positive 31 kilojoules per mole. And then we'll do the conversion right away of converting this to joules. So that's going to be 31,000 joules per mole. The reason we want to do that is that typically the value that we use for the gas constant R is in units of joules per Kelvin per mole, not in kilojoules. So we recall that the value for the gas constant R is 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole. And we're doing this at 25 degrees centigrade. So this is 298 Kelvin.
proceeding further, we get that this is equal to positive 31,000 joules per mole divided by 24,776 joules per mole, where we've canceled out inverse kelvins with kelvins. So I'll just show you that we've done that there as a first step. And now we're going to see that we have joules per mole and joules per mole in numerator denominator. So we're going to get a dimensionless quantity, a quantity with no units, with a value of 12.51. And notice that we have to do this. Now, typically, we're insistent on writing down units for calculations, and it's typical for students to omit necessary units. In this case, it is necessary to omit the units because there are no units. This is typically true when we're taking the logarithm. So if we're taking the natural logarithm or common logarithm, or we're taking the exponent of some particular quantity with units, uh, we can't do that. So if we take the natural log of some constant, the value that we get has to be unitless. So the value we get here is that the natural log of the equilibrium constant is equal to 12.51. Continuing, we raise each side of this equation that the natural log of k is equal to 12.51, each as a power of e. So we get e to the natural log of k is equal to e to the 12.51. And here we're using the fact that e to the natural log of anything is just the anything. So the e and the natural log essentially cancel out, and we get that the equilibrium constant is equal to e to the 12.51, which solving gives us a value of 2.7 times 10 to the 5 power. And this is exactly what we'd expect with the proper sign. Since the value of the Gibbs free energy is a negative number, that means that it is favored. So therefore, we'd expect to get a predominance of products over reactants. And that's exactly what we do. Since the uh, value is very large, we expect the equilibrium constant to be very large. If we were to get a Gibbs free energy that was equal to zero, we would expect to get an equilibrium constant that's equal to one. And if we had a positive uh, standard Gibbs free energy, we would expect to get an equilibrium constant that was much smaller than one. So, so far, the signs check with what we'd expect from what we know about thermodynamics. Now for a small complication that reality throws at us. In the actual hydrolysis of ATP in real cells, there are other uh, species that are important in the reaction. One of the most important of these is magnesium 2 plus ion. If we take that into account, the, the situation in a real cell, including the ions involved, such as magnesium 2 plus, it turns out that the equilibrium constant for the hydrolysis of ATP is really 1.0 times 10 to the 8. It's actually even larger in a real cell. So now in our next step, we are going to use the fact that the actual equilibrium constant is 1 times 10 to the 8 power and back calculate what the actual delta G naught for the complete ATP hydrolysis reaction must be. Now we're going to use the fact that delta G naught can be written in terms of minus R, the gas constant, times the temperature, times the natural log of the equilibrium constant. And this is the version of the relationship that is most useful in the current case because we're trying to figure out what delta G naught is equal to. So again, we know that the gas constant R is 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole. We know that the temperature is 298 Kelvin. And we also know that the equilibrium constant is 10 to the 8th power. So we have the natural log of 10 to the 8th power. 
So if we now multiply this out, we get minus 24,776 joules per mole. And this is times. So we use the fact that the natural log of 10 to the 8 is equal to 8 times the natural log of 10. So we have 8. And now the natural log of 10 is 2.303. And if we multiply this out, we get that the actual delta G naught under the conditions in a real cell is closer to minus 45.65 kilojoules per mole. Rather than the minus 31, which we started the problem with. The fact that the equilibrium constant for the hydrolysis of ATP has a value of 10 to the 8th may seem to be of only academic interest, and it may not seem terribly relevant to the understanding of reactions in a biochemical system. And we'll see that that is not true. Suppose, uh, especially because we tend to think of the hydrolysis of ATP merely as being a source of energy which of course it is, but it has another role which may be even more important. Suppose we have an incredibly important reaction that needs to take place in the cell where A is transformed into B. And B, for whatever reason, is a vital uh, nutrient or chemical in the system that needs to be made. Now we know that there's an equilibrium constant for this reaction, which is going to be the concentration of B divided by the concentration of A. We also realize that as important as enzymes are, enzymes speed up our approach to equilibrium, but they do not change the point of equilibrium. The only thing which we might know about as a way to shift the equilibrium is by changing the concentrations of A and B. So this is what we call the law of mass action. So if I want to get uh, I can't really change the proportions of A and B, so depending upon how much A I have, I'm going to get a certain amount of B, and there's very little I can do about it because the equilibrium constant is fixed for the reaction. Now suppose, just to pick a number, suppose that the equilibrium constant for this vital reaction, a reaction we definitely need B, is a very, very small number. Suppose it's 10 to the minus 3 power. So that means that for every one mole of A, we only have 10 to the minus three moles of B. So this is a reaction that lies very heavily on the side of reactants and makes very, very little product. But we need product, that's the problem. So otherwise our cell or our organism is going to die. So what we need is a way, biochemically, without violating the laws of chemistry and physics, to increase the amount of B, effectively to shift the equilibrium of this reaction to make this reaction somehow favorable. And the key to doing this is the hydrolysis of ATP. So instead of this reaction of A going to B occurring just by itself, it's going to be coupled to the hydrolysis of ATP. So we have ATP plus H2O leading to ATB, ATP plus phosphate. So now that these two reactions are coupled, we know that the equilibrium constant for the first reaction is 10 to the minus 3, which is a terrible value, it's very small, but we know that the equilibrium constant for the hydrolysis of ATP is very large, is equal to 10 to the eighth power. Now when we have coupled reactions, the overall equilibrium constant this overall, just to show what we're in here, is equal to the product of the equilibrium constants. So that means that to get the overall reaction, we multiply the equilibrium constant for the, for K up here, so, and that's 10 to minus 3. And we multiply it by the equilibrium constant for the hydrolysis of ATP. So when we do that, we see that 
we get 10 to the minus 3 times 10 to the eighth power. So this gives us an overall value of 10 to the 5, which is very, very largely on the side of the product B that we want. So if we have a reaction that has a very, very unfavorable equilibrium constant, we can effectively trick the system by coupling that reaction to the hydrolysis of ATP, and that for each mole of ATP that we hydrolyze, we shift the equilibrium constant by a factor of 10 to the eighth. Well, now suppose I have a reaction that's equally necessary where C gets transformed into D and my system really needs D, but the equilibrium constant in this case, which is the concentration of D divided by the concentration of C, is even smaller than 10 to the minus 3. Let's say it's going to be 10 to the minus 12. It's very, very, very unfavorable. So if I just count on the law of mass action to give me D, I'm only going to get, I'll need enormous amounts of C, and only a very small amount of the C is going to get transformed into D because the equilibrium constant is so poor. And I know that if I hydrolyze one mole of ATP, I'm going to shift the equilibrium constant by 10 to the 8th. But 10 to the minus 12 times 10 to the minus 8 is 10 to the minus 4, which still isn't all that great. But there's no reason that we have to use only one mole of ATP. So if I, multi if I hydrolyze two moles of ATP, so we have two ATP plus two H2O, and then we end up getting two moles of ADP and two phosphates. Now, the equilibrium constant in this case, I will just put two ATP to remind us here, is equal to 10 to the 16th power. We're using the fact that when we add reactions together, we multiply their equilibrium constants. So 10 to the 8th times 10 to the 8th is equal to 10 to the 16th power. So now, if I couple these two reactions together, I get an overall equilibrium constant, as I expect, which is going to be 10 to the minus 12, times 10 to the 16th power, which is 10 to the 4th, which is a very, very favorable equilibrium constant. So one of the tricks, so to speak, that biological systems have figured out is that by coupling the hydrolysis of a sufficient number of moles of ATP, they can make essentially any reaction, no matter how unfavorable, favorable. Now, the cost of that is that you're using up uh, ATP that it took you uh, the intake of food or of uh, solar energy in the case of a plant to make this. So, but we see that in addition to just simply supplying energy for the organism, that ATP allows us to, to turn very, very unfavorable reactions because of their equilibrium constants into favorable reactions. And this is helpful because very often the products that the organism needs are the products of reactions that have unfavorable equilibrium constants. I thank you very much for your attention. Have a good one.